If you would, open up your Bibles with me to 1 John chapter 5, 18 through 21. It's page 1,213 in the blue Bible in front of you if you're using that one. It's 1,213. Title this message, We Know. We Know. Lord willing, if I don't drop over dead during this sermon, we're going to finish uh, 1 John chapter 5, 18 through 21. And if I do, don't feel bad for me. I'm in glory. Amen. Hopefully that was not a prophetic statement, huh? <laughs> he knew it. It's 1 John chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. People of God hear the holy, inspired, and errant, infallible, authoritative word of the living God. And here is what he says to us today. He says this, We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Let's go to the Lord and ask for his help, for I need it, we need it. Lord, we humbly come before you and yet at the same time confess pride. Forgive us. Lord, open up our hearts. Fill me with your Holy Spirit to preach with power, clarity, and truth. Lord, work in this time. We come with nothing in our hands. We cling to you. We pray to get the glory. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In this life, for many people, to say that you know anything is to really to be intolerant. That's the popular thing today. To say you know something is to be uh, bigoted, it's, it's completely unacceptable in our culture in a lot of ways. Unless, of course, you say, the only thing I know is that I know nothing, then that is popular. Which, of course, that is something that you know and contradicts itself. But it's the day and the age we live in. It's the world in which we live in. It's the way the world is and the way the world is going. But John here today is leading us in a different way. He's leading us in a different direction from the way of the world. John is going against the grain. And so must we as Christians in this world we live. And as we end 1 John here today, as I said, John doesn't want us leaving this letter with a bunch of uncertainties. He doesn't want us walking out of church with a bunch of unknowns. He doesn't want us driving home today or out to eat, just throwing our hands up in the air and saying, I don't know. I don't know. John leaves us as we leave 1 John today wanting us to be certain of things, wanting us to know things, and wanting us to know some of the most important things in this life to know. Sure, there are a lot of unknowns in this life. Sure, we don't know everything. The secret things belong to the Lord. Sure, the Lord doesn't give us everything and help us know everything about everything, but God wants us to be certain about certain things. And we can see in this text there's three specific things that John and the Lord want us to be certain we know. And here they are. We are protected. We know God. And keep yourselves from idols. Let me say that again. As we leave here today, as we leave 1 John, God wants us to be sure that we know we are protected, that we know we know God, and that we know we need to keep ourselves from idols. And if you can get that in your head and in your heart today. Or if you already know that and you're convinced of that. To, to more anchor that in your soul today. You will be in far better shape. This will be very helpful to you today. And it will help you. It will help me. And it will help others as we go out into that world. And share what we know. Let's start where the passage starts with we are protected. It's the first thing we need to know. Starting in verse 18 there with me, it says this, 
we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who is born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. Now, that might sound somewhat familiar. And as we've seen through 1 John, John keeps coming back to different topics, similar topics, sometimes the same topics, and he hits them from different angles. You'd say, oh, here we go again about him saying about not sinning, but he hits it from a different angle today. And here in the first passage, it is. And he says that the true Christian, everyone born of God, saying the true Christian does not keep on sinning. But we know we keep on sinning. So what is John really saying here? Well, think of the context. Remember back when we went through 1 John 3, 9. What did John say there? He said this. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. And yet in 1 John 9, or 1, 9 through 10, he said... If we sin and we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So John says we don't keep on sinning, we don't practice sinning, and yet over here he says, but we do sin. So what is John saying? Well, as we looked at before, when we looked at 1 John 3, 9, is that John says we don't as Christians make a habitual practice of sinning, a style of our lives. We slip into sin, unfortunately. We'll go after sin for a time, unfortunately. But we don't jump in the pool of sin and just stay there and swim around going, I love it here, I'm going to stay here forever. True Christians will not do that. They may fall for a time, but they will not stay there. Makes me think of what was just recently told to me this week about a drag queen preacher named Penny Cost. I mean, I'm not making this up. I mean, it's just the first drag queen, and I don't mean to pick on the Methodists, ordained in a United Methodist Church, which is why we have people fleeing that and coming here and praise God that you have. And the other Christians in that denomination and others like it need to flee as well. But <clears throat> Pentecost, the pun, right, making fun of Pentecost, of all things, blasphemous, often goes and travels around to pulpits blaspheming the name of God, who said as he, <laughs> dressed up as a she, was referencing the queer Bible commentary. I don't have that one in my library, nor will I ever. <laughs> referencing that says that, he wants to rethink the cross, reevaluate the cross of Jesus Christ. Doesn't really like a substitutionary death and blood and all that, but instead look through the lens of queerness, look through the lens of drag. Doesn't even make sense. And I wish I was making that up. It's a joke, but I'm not. It's disturbing. That would be an example of practicing sin. That would be an example of habitual sin of swimming in sin, and in this case, dragging others, no pun intended there, with you along in it. And John says, penny cost is not a Christian, nor are people like that who habitually practice and swim in sin. And that's not the only place it is. Because in 1 John 3, 9, he gave us a reason. It says this, for God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. When you put your trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you and will not let you habitually swim in sin. The Holy Spirit, he will convict you and pull you out of that. But today, that's 1 John 3, 9. Today, John gives us another reason why you cannot habitually practice sin if you're a true Christian. And he says it this way, that Jesus protects us. We cannot habitually practice sin because not only the Holy Spirit resides in us, but Jesus protects us. He says it there when he says in verse 18, the second half, this, but he who was born of God protects him. Now, there are two ways of looking about who is it that protects us? Some will say, that's us. We're the ones protecting us. And there is some truth in that in the Bible and overall context, right? We're told to fight against sin, us. We're told to resist the devil and he will flee from you, James 4, Ephesians 6, and others. But that's not the context here. That's not what John is referring to here. He's not talking about us protecting us here. He's talking about Jesus protecting us here. 
Think about how John refers to, in John 1, 14 to Jesus. He says this, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father. God's son, perhaps more, even more explicitly, Luke 1, 35. And the angel answered her, meaning answered Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And here it is. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. It is he, Jesus, who is God, born in the flesh, born of God in the flesh by Mary. It is he who protects us. And listen to how Jesus words it in John 10, 27 through 28. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Jesus says, I protect my sheep. Christians, I protect them, Jesus says, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. That's the protection of the absolute certainty of Jesus Christ. But what does he protect Christians from? It's really the next question, right? From trials, from hard times, is that what he protects us from? No, he promised the, the exact opposite. We would go through them. Right? We have Christians that die every day across the world for the faith. Pastors are in jail right now in many countries for being Christians and preaching the gospel. You read in like Voice of the Martyrs and others how Christians, when they turn to Christ, their heads are cut off in other countries. We can't even fathom it. Their families are raped and tortured for following Christ. All the apostles died a martyr's death except for John who wrote this and he went through his fair share of torture for the faith. So John of all people knows Jesus does not promise to protect us from hard times, from trials, from even death for the faith. So what does Jesus protect us from? Well, what has John been talking about in his letter overall in the context Back in 1 John 2, what did John say? He brought up these people who were professing Christians, were in the confines of the visible church of Christianity, who left Christianity, who once said Jesus is the Messiah, who once said Jesus is the eternal God, but left and now we're saying the exact opposite. They even said you can make a habitual practice of sinning and it doesn't matter to God. Live like hell, it's fine. That's what they were saying. And John's been fighting against that through his letter. So if you put that all together, what I believe John is saying is Jesus protects us from doing what they did. The true Christian can't do that. You will not leave the faith. You will not buy into those heretical doctrines that say Jesus is not your savior. That Jesus is not the eternal God. Because Christ protects you. The enemy, the evil one, is always trying to deceive us, is always trying to pull people away from Christ. And he does it even here. Always try to get you to doubt who he is, what he's done for you. Even he attacks us as true Christians. And yet you cannot truly be saved and truly lose your salvation because Jesus will keep you in the faith. He will protect you. He will never fail you. John even says in 1 John 2 about those people, knowing that some might be tempted and they were struggling with this, that people in 1 John would be tempted to think those people left Christianity, they were truly saved, then they left it. In that context, John refutes that very idea when he says this in 1 John 2, 19. They went out from us, meaning they left Christianity, but they were not of us. They were not Christians. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. That's why Jesus says, no one will pluck you out of my hand. That's why John says, they seem to be plucked, but they weren't in his hand. That's why Paul says in Philippians 1, 6, that I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you, God, as he talks to Christians, saved Christians, he who began that good work in you, quote, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He could never say that if you could lose your salvation. He could never say that. He could say, I hope, maybe, if you just will through it, 
He could never say that if you could lose your salvation. But Jesus will hold on to you, whether you believe that or not. Praise God. He will not fail you. He will hold you in his hand forever and ever. Through this life, he'll get you to heaven and he'll keep you for eternity. Because he protects us. And you've got to see the great hope in that. Not only I believe that because it's in the Bible, but it is a great thing to believe as well. It is such a comforting thing to believe. Not just that he saves us, but that he keeps us and protects us. If my salvation depended on me just gritting it out and just willing it out for the next 30 years, if the Lord gives me that long, with all the pitfalls that may hit my life, with all the trials that are probably going to hit me in the face and in the teeth. If it depended on me, I would be a complete mess every night and every morning. Well, I have enough juice to make it. What if my life falls apart? What if my stepbrother dies? What if marriage is close to me that, that I love those people? What if they just fall apart before my very own Eyes, what if the world goes to hell in a handbasket and someone puts a gun to my head and says, deny Christ or I'll pull the trigger? How do I know I won't deny the Lord Jesus? How do I know I will not leave or forsake him? You know, when Satan sought to destroy Peter, <clears throat> before Peter denied Jesus three times that he even knew him, Jesus predicted that and he told Peter these words in Luke 22, 31 through 32, which I think are very instructive here. He says to Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, <clears throat> to destroy you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter stayed a believer even though he failed Jesus. He never completely lost his salvation because Jesus prayed for him. Romans 8, 34, in the context of what can separate us from the love of God once we're saved, Paul asked this question, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who is raised, who is at the right hand of God. He's there right now, who indeed is interceding for us. You know how I know I'll make it home to heaven? You know how I know if you're in Christ, you'll make it home to heaven? The only way I know that and how you can know that is because Jesus protects you and he is at the right hand of the Father right now, praying for you, interceding for you, has you in his hand, protecting you, and he is holding you tight and he will never let you go. That's love. And we need to know this, brothers and sisters, because whether you know it or believe that are true, that it's true or not, it is, and it is comforting. Not me, not you, Christ, him alone. Don't trust in anyone or anything else. And he protects us because we know him and he knows us. We're his, we're his. And that's where, that leads us to the next thing that we know. We know that we know God. Look there in verse 19. We know that we know God. It says this. <clears throat> we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And here we see in verse 19 the great reality that Christians who walk with the Lord for any amount of time often take for granted if you're anything like me. We often take this for granted. It's this, that we know God. And that's exactly my point. You're like, yeah. That we know, let that sink in a minute. If you're in Christ, if you're saved here today, you know the living God. <clears throat> and John tells us that there is a great divide, really, because right after that, he says the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. There's a great divide in this world. You're either a child of God or a child of the devil. And Jesus tells the Pharisees in John 8, what? You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desire. There's children of God and children of the enemy. There are people who are born of God and there are people who are not. Jesus said in John 3, 3, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. You must be born from above, born of God, born again. And there are people who receive Christ and there are those who do not. 
as John said in John 1, 12, but to all who did receive him, meaning Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And we who are in Christ here today, who used to be under the sway of the evil one, who used to be unsaved, unforgiven, on our way to hell, God has in his grace and mercy and sovereignty reached down and saved us. And because of that, we now know God. He is now our father. And we are his sons. We are his daughters. That should blow us away. <clears throat> That's not all. You know how we know him? Verse 20. The Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. You and I didn't figure this out ourselves. You and I just didn't have better decision making than the others who didn't choose Christ. We have been giving understanding, he says, so that we may know him. It is of grace purely. And then John continues with a statement that should rock our worlds. He says in the second half of verse 21 this. And we are in him who is true. In his son Jesus Christ. He is the true God. Can you get any more explicit than that about Jesus' deity? His divinity. He says he is the true God. And there are many out there today who say Jesus is not the true God. They'll say that he was a great prophet, but he was not God. They'll say he was a great teacher, but he was not God. He was a great man, but he was not God. And yet God himself in his word has made it crystal clear that Jesus was not just a great teacher. He was God in the flesh, the God man who taught us. He was not just a great prophet. He was the greatest and who has spoken through all the prophets who have ever been truly speaking for God. He is God in the flesh. <clears throat> John himself, who wrote this letter, wrote in his gospel, John 1, 1 through 3, brings it out very clearly, says this, in the beginning was the word. That's Jesus. And the word was with God. And the word was God. And then he says, all things was, were made through him. John 8, 58, he says to the religious leaders, Jesus says this, blew them away. They didn't like this. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was... I am. Jesus claimed, I am the great I am. Jesus says, I am God in the flesh. I have always existed. It's me. And after poor doubting Thomas, as we call him, sees the resurrected Christ, he confesses in John 20, 28 to Jesus himself, my Lord and my God. <clears throat> Jesus is God. Now, where am I going with this? Think about it for a second. That Jesus, the one I just described, is the one who came for you. That is the Jesus who lived a perfect life on this earth for you. That is the Jesus who let his own creation crucify him for you. That is the Jesus who rose from the dead for you, defeating sin and death, showing that God's stamp of approval, his sacrifice worked. And it is that Jesus, God himself, who loves you, who cares for you, and who protects you. And yet it's the one that John describes in Revelation, another book he wrote, 1, 14 through 16, where he describes him not as a meek lamb this time, but more of a conquering king. He says this in John, or Revelation 1, 14 through 16, about Jesus, his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. His voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held the seven stars. From his mouth came a two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. You ever try to look at the sun shining in full strength? Don't do that. <clears throat> John tries to describe what Jesus looks like. It's like, he's like that. He's that incredible. Do you realize that you know God that you know this Jesus and you realize how amazing he is. The one who, when he saw his friend Lazarus dead, he saw all the people weeping and his friends Martha and Mary, the sisters of Lazarus. He takes it all in and John eleven thirty five 35, it says Jesus wept. That his heart, that one I just described in Revelation, his heart broke in that moment and he, that one, wept. 
The one who, as he hung on the cross, and he surveys the people who put him there wrongfully, as he listens to them ridicule him slanderously, he, for their sake, prays to God the Father and says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I would want to crush them right there, wouldn't you? He had the power to, but he didn't. The one who, after Peter said in, in his perhaps moment of most need or close to it, Peter says, I don't even know that guy, Jesus. Three times. And he restores Peter. He prayed for Peter. And yet he's the one coming back to judge this world. He's the one whose robe is dipped in the blood, the blood of his enemies. He's coming back on a white horse. He is coming back, the sovereign one, in all his strength to pulverize his enemies. It's incredible. Do you see it? Meekness and majesty, dominion and authority. This is our God. This is Jesus Christ. He is worthy of all praise. Have you forgotten that? Have you forgotten that? And if you're here today and you don't know this Jesus, if you've just played church all your life, or maybe you've never played church, but you're playing today, or maybe you know of Jesus, but you've never truly trusted Jesus, you don't actually know him intimately, today is the day to turn to that Jesus, that one, and live. Life is short. It is such a vapor. As I get older, and I'm only 37, I am reminded more and more of that. I was reminded of that again yesterday as I did a funeral. I was reminded of that last week as we were in the jail doing ministry, and a guy was crying because he remembered burying his 15-year-old daughter who died in a car crash. I was reminded of that two and a half years ago, doing my stepbrother's funeral, who I had hoped and prayed would be up here using his gift of music for God's glory right beside me. I was a kid yesterday. I'm 37 today. I'll be dead very soon, and so will you, my friend. As I looked at those people in that funeral home, and as I talked to one of the people there who was a believer, said, most of my family doesn't know the Lord. And I just look at these people, that if they don't turn to Christ, will spend an eternity in hell, which I deserve as well, but won't because of Jesus Christ. It disturbed me, and it disturbs me right now. And that's what should keep us up at night. That is what should bring tears to our eyes. And if you're in here and you don't know Christ, don't let that be you. Turn to the eternal God as I just described, Jesus Christ, who has his arms wide open to receive sinners like you, like me, who bids you to come today. Come and be forgiven. Come and be saved. Come and be redeemed. Come and receive eternal life. Come, come, come. Of course, Paul says in Romans 10, 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That includes you this morning. There's a distinct choice in this life. You can follow idols or you can follow Jesus Christ. And even believers can get swept up in idolatry as well. Which is why I think at the end of this letter, in the last verse, John gives us another thing we need to know. And it's this. Keep yourselves from idols. Keep yourselves from idols. Look with me in our final verse of 1 John. It's verse 21. It says this. <clears throat> Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Now here John uses that term of endearment, of concern, of love that he's used before in his letter, little children. The apostle of love. He loves the sheep. He loves these Christians he's writing to. And he says, keep yourselves from idols. Now what John just said there has perplexed many a theologian for many a years. It just doesn't seem to fit, does it? He says, we know this, we know that God, Jesus is eternal God, he is the Messiah, boom, 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 boom. Little children, keep yourself from idols. What? Where'd that come from, John? And many have said, why here, John? Why now? Why? Even some have said, this is so out of place that this must be a later addition by a scribe. Right? They'll say, this couldn't have been John. But that's not the case. This fits perfectly 
where it is, and this was written by John himself, and it makes perfect sense when, again, you look at the overall context. John ends here today where he started at the beginning of his letter. Listen to what he said in 1 John 1, 1, the very first verse. That which was from the beginning, meaning Jesus, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon, we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And then in verse 3, he says, I'm talking about Jesus Christ with his son, Jesus Christ. He says, Jesus was from the beginning. Makes you think of what he wrote in his gospel. What I quoted earlier, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. John is pointing to Jesus Christ, the eternal God. In verse 1. And then here in verse 20, at the end of John, he says even more directly, even more succinctly, Jesus Christ, quote, he is the true God. It's like bookends of this whole book. And then verse 21 is this, little children, keep yourself from idols. <clears throat> well, that didn't help me, Ryan. Let's put this all together. And in order to do that, we must ask what has been going on in 1 John? Oh, those people back in 1 John 2 who left Christianity. Remember them? Remember what they were saying? Jesus is not eternal God. Jesus is not the Messiah. They had put up an idol. And John has been refuting their claims throughout his letter. And that's why at the end, after he brings it back around, he starts with Jesus is the eternal God and says he's the Messiah as he goes through. Here he says he's the Messiah, he's the eternal God. He points to Jesus, the true Jesus, who Jesus actually is. And then he says in the context of those who left Jesus, keep yourself from idols. Keep yourself from idols. You see, back then there were gods all over the place. Gods of wood, gods of metal, Stone, they make gods for everything. <clears throat> Still like that in places of the world, although we don't often see it around us. But it's here too. But often in our culture, we become much more sophisticated in our idol worship. We find people worshiping the God of self. Worshiping other people. There was even a TV show, maybe it's still on, used to be American what? Idol. Idol. Some make idols out of their homes. Some make idols out of their cars. Some make idols out of their careers. Some make idols out of their kids even. Some make idols out of their, their spouses. <clears throat> Who, whatever, we, what Calvin said, our hearts are idol factories. We just manufacture them left and right. Not that anything is wrong with kids and homes and cars and all the blessings God gives us. But what's wrong is when we take our comfort, when we take our security, when we take our fulfillment out of Christ and we start switching it into these things, which is so easy to do. So easy to do when we have lots of them. But John says, little children, keep yourself from idols. Don't follow a false Christ as many man-made religions do. And don't follow idols of any kind. And it's really the choice, isn't it? You have the eternal God, Jesus Christ, worthy of all adoration and praise and glory. Or you can go worship and praise something else that is far less, not even comparable. You have Jesus who is worthy of all, who can fulfill every desire that has been given to you by God, your God-given desires. He can fulfill every need you have. Or you can go for all these trinkets in this world that often we try to cash in on, that leave us destroyed, broke, and broken. One is the truth. Jesus Christ and everything else are liars and idols. Choose what you want to follow. When I was at that funeral yesterday, I, well, I was there, verse 21 right here came, <clears throat> boom, came right to me. It had nothing to do with the deceased there. It had nothing to do with actually the, even the funeral or the family. Not, nothing there at all. But as I went to the gravesite, we we're going to do the gravesite dedication, right? We're walking. And a, a headstone, before we got there, I noticed uh, completely unrelated to the funeral, something that caught my eyes laying on that headstone. It struck me. The headstone had this on it. There was a husband and wife buried beside each other. And on the left, the wife, 
And there in front, laying on that headstone, said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I thought, wow, praise God. But to her husband, to the right, was laying right in front of his name, above where he would lie in the ground, above his head. <clears throat> Guess what it was? A beer can. And it just hit me, that's it. You know why I thought that? Because that morning I was trying to rush around to get this third point. I was on this point of the sermon. And I'm like, okay, I got a funeral. Then I gotta, okay. I'm going to try to get some of this done, you know, as I've already been working on it. And my computer freezes. I went, oh, the enemy. He's attacking. <clears throat> but the, my computer freezes. And I go, what is this? I'm having trouble getting this thing started. And I just get this strong impression from the Lord. He doesn't want me to continue on because there's something at this funeral he wants to show me or tell me that's going to go in this point of the sermon. Can't explain it. It was a strong impression from the Lord. I said, fine, Lord. Shut down the computer. Went upstairs. And I'm at this funeral and I'm just, I forgot about that. But when I saw that on that headstone, I went, that's it. It just hit me. Why was that it? Now, I have no clue about those people at that tombstone. I don't. And their relationship with Jesus. But here you have a man who was known by his friends and family, likely. A man that left behind a legacy of drinking alcohol and likely drunkenness, of chasing an idol. I'm not saying drinking beer is bad. I'm saying drunk in a sin. And if there's a beer can on his tomb, he probably was a drunk. And here beside him, two worlds apart, and yet so close, his own wife, who was remembered because of the Lord in her life. And oh, how the choice is still the same today for each one of us who is still living. Are you going to be remembered as someone who puts your trust, your faith, your life and hope in idols, in alcohol, in sex, in drugs, whatever, in people? Or are you going to be remembered who put your trust in Jesus Christ? That's the question. Who's going to be remembered that you loved Christ? You know, I tell my wife, I said, I want my kids to remember that Christ loved me and I love Jesus Christ. I don't want them to think I was an awesome basketball player. Because I'm not. A great hunter. Because I'm not. But even if I was, I want them to remember that Jesus loved me and he lived his life for Christ in the power and grace of Christ who knew he was protected by Christ, who knew he knew Christ, and who knew he needed to keep himself from idols. And I give that same question to Christians in here today, because obviously if you're not a Christian, you're not following the true Christ. You're following idols of some type. But you're not out of the water if you're a Christian, because sometimes in our walk with Christ, well, it's such a struggle at times. We start to get drawn away into idolatry of all kinds, right? Maybe don't, you don't lose your salvation or you completely turn from Christ, but you start losing your focus on him and you start looking at these things here. You start looking at these things over there, you start getting your comfort, your security, your pleasure, not from the Lord as much, but from these things now. It happens all over the place. Maybe it's what you're living in your life right now, brother or sister. When Jesus is supposed to be our ultimate comfort, our ultimate security, our ultimate pleasure from knowing he protects us, from knowing we're his, from knowing we need to keep ourselves from idols and worship him, the living and true God. And he beats everything else out there combined. There is no comparison to Jesus Christ. No comparison. <clears throat> so I leave you where John leaves us with as we exit first John here today. We know many things, but the important, the most important things we need to know from here today is that we're protected, that we know him and keep yourselves from idols, little children. It's a dangerous world out there, but in Christ we will stand. Let's pray. Lord, help us stand in you. Lord, if there's anyone including myself, that is chasing after idols and we don't even know it. Reveal it to us. Help us repent. Draw closer to you, Lord. Lord, I pray if anyone does not know you, draw them to yourself here now. Lord, we love you. We thank you that you are who you are. And in spite of who we are, you love us and you've saved us. In Jesus' name, amen.